Something Beautiful for God, Mother Teresa of Calcutta, Part 3. Discussions are endlessly taking place about how to use a mass medium like television for Christian purposes, and all manner of devices are tried, from dialogues with learned atheists and humanists to pop versions of the Psalms and psychedelic romps. Here was the answer. Just get on the screen a face shining and overflowing with Christian love. Someone for whom the world is nothing and the service of Christ everything. Someone reborn out of servitude to the ego and the flesh and into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Then it doesn't matter how the face is lighted or shot, whether in front or profile, close up or two shot or long shot. What questions are put? or by whom. The message comes over as it did from St. Paul, not it would appear particularly glib or photogenic himself. It might seem surprising on the face of it that an obscure nun of Albanian origins, very nervous, as was clearly apparent in front of the camera, somewhat halting in speech, should reach English viewers on a Sunday evening as no professional Christian apologist, bishop, or archbishop, moderator or knockabout progressive dog-collared demonstrator ever has. But this is exactly what happened to the surprise of all professionally concerned, including me. The message was the same message that was heard in the world for the first time 2,000 years ago. As Mother Teresa showed, it has not changed its sense or lost its magic. As then, so now, it is brought, not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. The Mother Teresa program was repeated quite soon after its first showing in response to numerous requests, and the response to the repeat program was even greater than the original one. Altogether, something like 20,000 pounds found its way to the co-workers of Mother Teresa, an organization of people, many of whom, have lived in Calcutta and fallen under Mother Teresa's spell there, who exert themselves steadily and steadfastly on her behalf. No appeal for funds was made on the program, but of course, Mother Teresa needs money. More and more of it as her work expands. It is a matter about which she takes an extremely practical view. When the Pope visited India on leaving, he presented her with his white ceremonial motor car. She never so much as took a ride in it, but shrewdly organized a raffle with the car as the prize, thereby raising enough money to get her leper colony started. The rich, when they come to her, are liable to leave a little less rich, which she considers is conferring a great favor on them. On the other hand, she has never accepted any government grants in connection with her medical and social work. This, she says with another of her quizzical smiles, would involve keeping accounts. I quite see her point. The administration of her whole organization is undertaken by two nuns with one rickety typewriter between them. If auditors and that sort of thing had to be coped with, this department would need to expand. And she grudges every moment expended and penny spent other than on carrying out Christ's two commands, to love God and to love her neighbor. Actually, the efficiency with which everything is managed is quite remarkable. Computers would only spoil it. Her own clerical work is done at night when the sisters have retired. She writes most of her letters in her own hand. I have a number which I cherish. Nobody knows when she goes to sleep herself, but certainly her nights are often very abbreviated. This, of course, does not interfere with her appearance in the early morning for prayers and mass. It is possible sometimes to see that she is tired, but not by anything in her bearing or expression or speech just by a sort of tightness around her eyes, which still, however, look out on the world with an impregnable serenity. Does she worry? To be responsible as she is for houses in different parts of the world and all of the activities associated with them, as well as for ever-growing numbers of sisters at different stages in their formation, without any fixed income or source of revenue, would make most people worry. There have been times, I know, when word has come from one or other of the houses that there is just no money left. Then you must beg, Mother Teresa might have to say. 
It is, I think, something she would joyously undertake herself. Begging, when it is for Christ, is a beautiful activity and not at all demeaning. After all, the first Christians were mostly slaves. As Simon Whale says, Christianity is a religion for slaves. We have to make ourselves slaves and beggars to follow Christ. Despite this chronic financial stringency of the missionaries of charity, when I was instrumental in steering a few hundred pounds in Mother Teresa's direction, she astonished and, I must say, enchanted me by expending it on the chalice and ciborium for her new novitiate. So, she wrote, you will be daily on the altar close to the body of Christ. Her action might, I suppose, be criticized on the same lines as the waste of spikenard ointment, but it gave me a great feeling of contentment at the time and subsequently. After this experience of interviewing Mother Teresa, I had a consuming desire to go to Calcutta and participate in making a television program about her and her work. This became possible in the spring of 1969, thanks to the BBC. The corporation receives a good deal of criticism one way and another, most of it deserved. I have not been backward myself in joining it. All the same, the fact remains that it is prepared to pay for a program such as we made in Calcutta, which no commercial network would ever undertake, especially as it offers no possibilities in the way of advertising. Rather the reverse. Mother Teresa's way of looking at life is barren soil for copywriters, and the poorest of the poor she cherishes offers little in the way of ratings. I am duly grateful. Our producer and director was Peter Schaefer, with whom I have now worked quite a lot in different sorts of programs, always with ease and satisfaction. Our cameraman, Kim McMillan, who covered himself with glory filming the Kenneth Clark series, Civilization. Commenting to me on his work, Lord Clark said that it has a very special quality all of its own because Ken is an artist. I agree. We arrived at Calcutta Airport on one of those heavy, humid days for which Bengal is famous. The air seems to distill into water as one breathes it, and every movement costs one a stupendous effort, like moving dropsical limbs. A general strike, we were told, had been organized for the following day, which gave an additional feeling of suspense to an, in any case, overcharged atmosphere. As we only had five days to do our filming, we decided to go almost at once to 54A Lower Circular Road, the address of the Missionaries of Charity. Mother Teresa was waiting for us in the little courtyard of their house. The sight of her, or even the thought of her, always gives me a great feeling of happiness. This time more than ever, by way of contrast with the somber sense of strain and anxiety all around us. Characteristically, having in the first instance resisted our coming with cameras at all, when she finally agreed, she gave us her full cooperation for the stipulated five days. She has a deep-seated and well-founded suspicion of the whole filming procedures, which had to be overcome by, among other things, a charmingly persuasive letter from Cardinal Heenan, to whom she wrote in reply, If this TV program is going to help people to love God better, then we will have it, but with one condition, that the brothers and sisters be included as they do the work. This condition, I must say, was faithfully observed. The house has nothing particularly to recommend it, architecturally or any other way. It is just a large Calcutta house, probably occupied formerly by some prospective Valkel and his tribe of dependents. Yet the courtyard, where I was to spend a good many hours during the days we were filming, has something delectable about it, as I recall it, as though it were one of those courtyards in Provence with a vine climbing up the walls and spreading out to give shade, instead of just a bare stone space between walls with the sun beating down and outside the screech of the trams, the shouts, the interminable passing of bare or sandaled feet of a Calcutta street. While Ken and the sound recordists were setting up, Mother Teresa suggested we should go up to the chapel together. I readily agreed. 
The chapel is a long room with windows looking onto the street, the end, an altar, matting on the floor, and no decoration of any kind. There too, as I have said, the noise of the street is ever present. We knelt side by side. I have always found praying in any definitive sense very difficult. Somehow the notion of putting specific requests to God strikes me as unseemly, if not absurd. I squirm when I hear trendy clergymen asking God to attend to our balance of payments or to adjust the terms of trade more in accordance with the interests of underdeveloped countries or to ensure in a forthcoming general election that the best man wins. Also, when old-style evangelicals, with, I am sure, utter sincerity, recount how, in response to their prayers, God made their businesses prosper or brought them into contact with a particularly lucrative client, in all this field of our material well-being, individual or collective, I can never find anything to say to God except, Thy will be done. If it is true, as St. Paul tells us, and it surely is, that all things work together for good to them that love God, then all that is required of us is that we should love God, and in loving him, fall in with his purposes. Nonetheless, there is a prayer of St. Augustine, a fellow communicator who once called himself, as I must, a vendor of words that I often say over and did on this occasion, kneeling beside Mother Teresa. Let me offer you in sacrifice the service of my thoughts and my tongue, but first give me what I may offer you. I once scribbled down my own version of the flyleaf of the paperback edition of St. Augustine's Confessions. O oh God, stay with me. Let no word cross my lips that is not your word. No thought enter my mind that is not your thought. No deed ever be done or entertained by me that is not your deed. The note I see is dated 7 April 1968 at Salem, Oregon. When I left Calcutta, Mother Teresa gave me a copy of the little manual of devotion she and the sisters use. Like their hymnal, it is cyclostyled none too efficiently. Any expenditure in printing would seem to her indefensible. In my copy, a very precious possession, she wrote, Make us worthy, Lord, to serve our fellow men throughout the world who live and die in poverty and hunger. Give them through our hands this day their daily bread, and by our understanding love, give peace and joy. And I think we'll wrap it up here for today, and we'll continue in the next video. Thanks so much for listening. Please like and subscribe, and come back for our next video. I love you guys. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now.